How to make a coal-fired steam engine boiler plant, part 15, making and fitting the fire hole door, properly this time. These are the pair of hinges that I made in the last episode, and they're just about to go in the bin. But before I put them in the bin, I would just like to say, the only real mistake I made with them was to grind the ends wrong. I took too much metal off the ends, as you can see, they're misshapen. Drilling several holes in a row, by eye, is not a good idea. So here is a new milled blank. I've ground the end to the correct shape now. It's a little thicker on the inside, but that's a good thing, it makes it stronger. There are quite a few ways to achieve this roundness on the end of a piece of metal. I could have put a vertical peg in the machine vise, and then rotated the part against a milling cutter. And that's the way I would round the ends of locomotive coupling rods. Alternatively, I could use some things called filing buttons, which are hardened pieces of steel, but I don't have any of those. So I did it by hand on my one inch belt sander. I took my time with it and got it to be exactly the shape I wanted it to be. Over now to the bandsaw. And here's a top tip. The first thing to do is to set the guide on the bandsaw and then gently touch the front edge on the blade. Measure the two halves and you will soon find out whether you're cutting down the middle. Health and safety warning. Well, it's just a health and safety warning. Be careful when you're doing this because if your finger goes into the bandsaw blade, your finger will have a nice groove down it, and it's also a very painful experience. Please be very careful when using any kind of a machine tool. Don't be frightened of them, just treat them with great respect. I'm using a piece of wood here to push the last part through the blade. With both of the hinges temporarily fitted to the fire hole door mounting, I use my one inch belt sander to finally grind the edges to shape, and as you can see, they're much more even. Get ready for a bit of real engineering precision. I'm just marking out with a felt tip pen how long I want these hinges to be. And then I take them to the bandsaw and chop them to length. With the nut and bolt securely tightened, I took the part to the belt sander for the final adjustment to the shape. I ground the entire assembly, the middle part and the hinges to the same shape. And now the hinges and the mounting are exactly the same shape just the way I wanted it to look in the first place. And that's why I didn't bother with the previous set of hinges. They were too narrow, the ends were not shaped correctly, and the drilling of the holes was academic. I did that on purpose. As I mentioned earlier, I just drilled them by eye on the scribe marks and made a thorough mess of it. And I'll take this opportunity to thank the viewers who took the time to write in and tell me how to do it properly and what I should have done. Really, I just wanted to illustrate something that I see all the time. Things like this fire hole door hinges are often drilled freehand and the holes are just not in the right place and it looks terrible. So now it's over to my precision marking out table which is a lump of steel sat on the bench. Often fire hole door rivets are in the wrong place. They don't start early enough and it's very easy for the hinges to get bent in normal use and then the fire hole door is sprained and doesn't shut properly. And also, because this boiler is a very decorative item, the fire hole door assembly is made of brass, which is not as strong as steel, so it will bend even more easily. As you can see clearly from this clip, the hinges are bolted together, and I'm lightly scribing marks at quarter of an inch intervals. The very last one will be very close to the edge of the fire hole door. And now I'm drilling the holes. Not quite at this speed, once again it's speeded up to save some time, and I've already spotted the holes with a centre drill. And when I did this, I did not do it freehand. I used the machine. On the end of the machine is a wheel, and mounted inboard of the handle on the same shaft is a dial, and you can reset this dial. I'm looking for zero. There it is. And what you can't see at this moment in time is as I set the dial to zero, the centre drill on the hinge was exactly on one of the marks. And now I'm rotating the hand wheel, not the dial, the hand wheel, and watching the centre drill, and when it's over the next mark, I know that this is the correct distance that I need. And it worked out at two turns back to zero and then a 13. This is a very simplistic way of doing it, I know. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not an engineer either. I'm a musician and this is how my brain works and I do apologise to all the experts watching. I just want to get the holes drilled in the piece of metal. And if I did it mathematically, it would always work out the same anyway. The hand wheel is graduated in thousandths of an inch as it's an imperial machine from many years ago. But as far as I'm concerned, two zeros and a 13 is the way to go. That's the way I'm remembering it. 
and now armed with this formula, I do not even need to look at the marks ascribed on the metal. I know that two zeros and a thirteen will be approximately a quarter of an inch, and I can carry on drilling. A quarter of an inch is really two hundred and fifty thou, by the way. And now, confident that the centre drill marks are in the correct place, I can drill all the way through using a sixteenth of an inch diameter twist drill. No, wait, no, wait, hang on, no, I'm lying. This is not a sixteenth of an inch diameter twist drill. This is a number drill that is a fraction larger than a sixteenth of an inch. If I drill the holes with a sixteenth of an inch twist drill, then the rivets will be a very tight fit in the holes, and I don't want this. Time now for a bit of rock and roll. I'm removing the marks on the top of the hinges on a piece of sandpaper. And I'm also taking this opportunity to clean up the firehole door blank. I did some more cleaning and polishing later on, but that's okay for the moment. And now when I put the hinges on top of the firehole door, you can see that the holes are in the correct place. These hinges are ground to the correct profile to match this piece. Also the holes are in the right place and they're not too thin. The other ones were far too thin, I ground too much off them. What I need to do next is drill some holes in the firehole door itself and I need to use the holes in the hinges as guides for the drill. But I don't want to drill through the firehole door into the housing. So what I'm going to do is use some Loctite 603, my favourite stuff, and here's a top tip once again. I'm going to use the Loctite 603 to temporarily stick the hinges to the firehole door blank. After which I can remove the firehole door, complete with the hinges, and drill through the holes in the hinges all the way through the firehole door blank. I'll speed this bit up to save some time. Once the Loctite 603 has set, I'm initially spotting through the holes with the drill. This is just in case, when I start to drill it properly, the hinges pop off the top of the blank, in which case I would be a bit stuck and I may get misalignment. But obviously I am not drilling all the way through into the housing. I won't speed up this part of the video because I would like to say a few words. When I first started making these how-to type videos for beginners, it was a bit of a hobby. I thought, well I'm doing the jobs anyway, I may as well film them on my little video camera. But like with most things that I do, I do tend to get a bit obsessive and now I'm putting far too many hours in doing these videos, and I was going to stop doing it because it's affecting my life. Regular viewers to the channel will notice that the amount of videos that I'm putting up here is increasing rapidly. But do bear in mind, and I'll give you a good example now, this video I'm currently making is three quarters of the way voiced over, and so far I've spent two and a half hours doing this. And that doesn't really include the filming, but I don't include the filming because even though it does take some time, I'm in the workshop doing the job. And also, I'm trying to make each video slightly longer. This week, I've done one video every day, so that's three hours approximately each video multiplied by seven, that's 21 hours spent doing videos. This is a labour of love. Some of the jobs that I do, that I make the videos from, are actually paid jobs. But whilst I'm doing a video, I'm not actually working on paid jobs. This project is not a paid job, this is my boiler that I'm working on. Where is all this leading, I hear you ask? The adverts that YouTube put on the front of these videos, and they're not there all the time, but when they're there, if someone clicks on the advert and watches the advert full length, I get a very small remuneration. As the hits have increased recently on my channel, this is a good thing for me, because obviously the revenue has gone up slightly. What I would ideally like to do now at my time of life is do this full time. Make the videos, repair engines, people send me engines, I make videos, and the thing is self-replicating. The initial idea of having a YouTube channel and doing things like this is so that I could effectively put something back. And that also applies to the Hammond Organ Jazz and Rock Licks video. I sell that as a DVD, as indeed I sell How to Build a Model Steam Launch. But the bulk of my video is free for every viewer, and I would like to keep it that way. Very shortly I'm going to be doing how to build a model steam engine and this will be a really good video series. Right from opening the package of raw materials that the postman brings to steaming the finished engine. And this is the reason for me adding a PayPal me link to some of the videos. And I sincerely thank anyone who's made a donation. Thank you. And to the viewers who sent me messages that were very unkind, I don't thank you for that you sad pathetic people. So there we have it, I think I will also open a Patreon account, but I haven't had much time to do anything lately. And now, after getting that off my chest, it's time to countersink the other side of the firehole door. 
I'm using a drill bit for this, not a countersink, that would be too big and it would burr the edges. Very important, of course, to use a depth stop, because if you use a drill, it will grab and go all the way through, and then the job is spoilt. And at this point, some beginners may be thinking, why is he countersinking the other side? Please keep watching, everything will become apparent in the fullness of time. I've popped the rivets in to make sure they all fit in the holes, and I'm using a felt tip pen to make some marks on the metal, so when I dismantle this, the hinges can be repositioned in exactly the same place. I also need to remove some metal from this part, otherwise the door will not open. This device is called a rivet snap. It's a very simple thing, the rivet sits in the top of it. You put the rivet snap in the vise, and then using a very small hammer, you hammer the other end of the copper rivet into the countersink. And if, for instance, you wanted a rivet head on both sides, you would use two snaps, one held in the vise, and the other one as a punch, which would shape the head. It's very important to use the right size, this one's miles too big. If you're going to do any riveting, you need a set of these rivet snaps. I get mine of course from Blackgates Engineering, and the details once again are on screen. And before I get any comments from any trolls out there, no, I do not receive income from Blackgates Engineering, they are good friends of mine. For a riveting job of this size, you need a very small hammer. I'll stop the video at this point just to mention that you must always hold the part level on the rivet snap, otherwise you will get marks on the metal underneath. I find riveting, well, riveting, and strangely satisfying. You have to be very accurate with the hammer. If you're clumsy with the hammer, you will make really bad marks in the metal that you're hitting. You're supposed to hit the rivet, not the brass part that you're riveting. And the idea, of course, is to expand the copper rivet into the countersink and this will make it fairly impossible for the hinge to drop off. Maybe I'm making this look a little bit too easy. It is, but you learn how to be accurate with the hammer after a while. And you need to be really careful when riveting so close to the edge of the firehole door, like you see I'm doing here. And it's also very close to the hinge itself. So if you hit the hinge, you do have a major problem. I'm showing this operation 100% in real time. So if I make a mistake, you will see it. But in retrospect, I think I will speed the video up. The good thing about this section is that the intermittent hammer blows should be sufficient to keep the viewers awake. The good thing about speeding up the video is that you will see that I keep the part on the rivet snap level at all times. Once the riveting is complete and the rivets are firmly hammered into the countersinks, it's time to go over to the one inch belt sander and just clean up the underside. And as you can see, this is quite a well made fire hole door. I cleaned it up on the polishing spindle and there's still some remnants of the polishing spindle wax on the rivets. I'll get rid of that later. In this clip I'm removing the temporary bolt that's been used to hold the hinges to the main fire holder mounting. And I'm replacing the bolt with a piece of 8th steel that I've threaded both ends 6BA, which meant I had to turn down each end and thread it in the lathe. And now I'm using my pair of Barco spanners, and yes, I have two of them to tighten the nuts onto the shaft. Has it been worth it, I ask myself. Yes, I think it has. This is going to look really nice when it's finished. I have the catch to make next, but I'll do that later, that's a nothing job. That's about it for this video. I would like to personally thank anyone who has made a donation. And thanks for watching, I hope you found it useful.